Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, you know, after a week of rain, it sure looks nice outside. <laughs> Sun's outside and the sun is in here. Amen. Amen. All right, well, I want to welcome you all, whether you're here in person or online to our service this morning. It is going to be a great day. Um, to get started with this morning, uh, yesterday we had our Orange Track Racing and uh, we live streamed for the very first time in 15 years. Love technology, right? And um, it was a great day. Uh, looking forward to what God has with that in the future. But uh, one of the things that we want to talk about this morning is what's coming up this coming weekend. We got a big weekend coming up. Uh, on Saturday, we're going to have our movie, and I'm going to have Diane go ahead and just advance, and we're going to watch the trailer for that real quick. Let's get you to college. Jeremy. No way. It's a gift from all of us. Not bad at all. Mr. Camp. Hmm. You want to come back to Earth? Hi. Hi. If you're free, I'll be at the beach. It's a date. What? You literally just asked me out. We'll see. will be opening at 5.30, movie at 6. We're excited for this movie. This is an amazing movie. Um, I'm going to just tell you all whether you're here or watching online, bring some Kleenex with you. That's all I'm going to say. It's an amazing movie and uh, looking forward to seeing that with you. Then on Sunday, Stronger Together, we are, and that's what we've been talking about for since we planted this church. Since we've started the ministry, we are stronger together. Unity is, we used that word a lot at the beginning and, and we've used it continually. But this says it, uh, puts kind of that exclamation mark on it. We are stronger together. So we want you to join us next Sunday. We would love for you all to join us in person, but let's blow it up in here. Let's blow it up online. Let's have just um, a lot of people hearing God's word next week. For those of you who are here, we have invitations that you can take. You can hand these out, and there's a spot on the back for a stamp, and you put somebody's address, toss it in the mail, they'll have it in a day or two, and they can come and join us as well. So um, that and on Facebook, we've got that up as well, so you can invite your friends on there as well. So a lot coming on. I'm gonna have Diane go ahead and play that next video.
people are waiting to be invited to church. It's, it's one thing to go somewhere, but you go and you're kind of like, you're apprehensive and you may not want to go, but if somebody invites you, all of a sudden that starts to melt away and you feel more inclined to go. You feel more comfortable about joining. So think about who you can invite and then invite them to join us. Um, one thing I want to mention before we go to our call of worship today, this past week, we celebrated another milestone. 19 years ago, our country was attacked by terrorists. 3,000 people went to bed the night before 9-11, not knowing that they would never see their loved ones again or go home again. Some of us even know people who were first responders or were there moment, you know, shortly after to help with the cleanup and to take care of things. Some of you may know someone who was affected. I, I told him yesterday at racing that I had a gal that worked for me then that she knew everyone in one of the offices on the 110th floor and they all died instantly. And then our worship team leader at the time, his wife, was the cousin of the co-pilot of Flight 93. Got real, real in a hurry. Because, you know, we've become kind of jaded to things that happen in our world. The beauty of the scriptures is, is it keeps us from doing that. So, if you haven't uh, this week, take a time uh, today in a moment of silence and pray for those families who lost a loved one we lost friends, and we just pray that this never happens again, that we could all just, as we've been talking about for four weeks now, love our neighbors and, and love our enemies as we love God. So this morning, Pastor Mark is going to be giving us a great message. And he, the call to worship this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12 verses 10 through 12. And it says this, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in His holiness. Now, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's, it's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of bright living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. And as I read that uh, the first time this week, I was reminded, you know what? I remember, Dad, you know, we, we did some wrong. And I, I never remember getting the belt, but I do remember that coming off of his pants and folded over in half and he had this way of making an O out of it and then he drew his hand, arms away and made that loud leather snap. Now for me, that was enough. My little brother, maybe not so much. My mom, her thing was, especially if we were out in public, she would just kind of reach over with her hand and squeeze your knee. And you knew at that point you needed to be quiet or stop whatever you were doing or you were going to get in trouble. I tried that with Carissa once. Didn't work out so well. Every kid's different. But the, the gist of this is, is that when we are disciplined, we learn what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And it does hurt. It, if you got a belt or a wooden spoon as a kid, you know that hurts. If you were old enough that the teachers could still slap your hand with a ruler, you know that hurt. And it, it told you, don't do it again. It is not something that we enjoyed. But look at the right living that we have now from that. That we can live today with those lessons, knowing that they cared for us, knowing that they loved us. When God disciplines us, he cares for us and he loves us and he wants us to live according to his will. So Father God, as, as we hear Pastor Mark's message this morning, 
the message that you gave him this morning, Father. May we hear it. May it resonate within us. May we understand that as this scripture just now told us that, yes, discipline can hurt at first. And we may not enjoy it, but what comes from it, the fruit that comes from that, is what helps us in our lives. And it's not a discipline that you ever did in anger, Father. You did it out of love. That's the dis difference between good discipline and bad discipline. If it's done in anger, Father, we know that that is wrong. So let us, as we discipline those that need to be disciplined, may they see that it is done in love and to help them to learn as they move forward so that they can take their hands and, and strengthen their knees and come before you, Father, and walk that straight path. Father, let us hear what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Well, very good morning to everybody. How do you like that thing that appeared in the sky this morning? Did, did you all see it? It's yellow. It's called the sun. Hey, it came back out after a week. So it's a wonderful thing. And it's a beautiful day today. And this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, Pastor Terry kind of talked about a few things on here, uh, some of our past events that have happened, and those are playing out fresh in our minds again today after uh, the last 19 years. And those events really changed who we were and, and what we did as a society, as the current events are doing as well. And I want to cover some of that today in our message. So, let us start off right now with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you today to honor you in our worship this morning. We marvel at the wonders of your world that you have made for us. Lord God, your love is big enough to surround the whole world, and we ask today that you fill us today with your love, that we could share it with those who don't know you. Give them ears to hear that word, and give us the strength empower us, Lord, to be your hands and feet here on earth to bring that world and that word together so that you would be fresh in their hearts today. Thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. So as Terry was mentioning, we had September 11th of 2011 was a, a complete change in who we were and what we were to become since then in the last 19 years and there was a song that was done by the eagles and I, I want you to to listen to that song today and it's called there's a hole in the world tonight and it was written they were supposed to go into the studio and start on their next album but they found they really couldn't do it and instead they gathered together and just kind of started out as an acapella and and wrote this song to give to the world um, for 9-11. And so it was really, really apropos for those times. But if we look at what's going on in the world today and the changes that are going on in the world today and what we're going through as a community, as a society, as, as the United States, as the world is changing today, I think this song speaks to us in our current situation just as much as it did following 9-11. So let's take a listen to this song. Oh, well, now we're done with that. Uh, I think there are some very, very telling messages that came out in that song. And there's a hole in the world tonight, and there's a cloud of pain and sorrow. And when we look at the times following 9-11, that certainly was true. And if we look at the times that we're facing today and in our society today, we're facing many of those same things as well. And uh, so today's message that I want to bring to you is, is on perseverance and resilience. So our call to worship today came from Hebrews 12, verses 10 and 12. And 
It says, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. And it's kind of funny because everyone kind of associates that word of discipline in a negative fashion. But when I was going through my martial arts training back in the early 70s, uh, one of the things we did was it was called we had to do our disciplines. And it was a way of training our mind and our body to act as one. And yeah, it could get painful because you had to do all kinds of of gyrations with your body and everything, but it was training our body and mind to act as one, and it is called the disciplines. and And there was a whole uh, a whole regimen that you would go through depending upon what type of training that you were taking at that point in time. And for years, I, I used to do those disciplines every morning, and I'd get up and and Lori kind of saw some of those things a long time ago. Um, and I've kind of gotten away from it. And I kind of think it's the same way with when we have our training with God is sometimes we fall away from it a little bit. And we don't keep up that routine. We don't keep up that discipline for right ways and right things. And so we kind of fall away from it and it just kind of slips away. It becomes easier to, oh, let's just go have that cup of coffee first or oops, now i got to run and get to work, and, and things kind of change, and our routine changes. But see, that, that passage in Hebrews goes on to say in 13 and 14, it says, So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong call to listen to God working and living at peace with everyone. Work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So what that's talking about is that discipline, training ourselves to follow God each and every day, training ourselves at working at living a holy life, and it goes on to say, for those who are not holy won't see the Lord, so we need to look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. And see, that's what we're talking about this whole time, and that's what Stronger Together is all about. We're stronger as a whole than we are as individuals. And so as we live that holy life and we bring that grace of God to others, they become stronger as well. And community is built. And that community of love is built for one another. So we have the picture up on the screen today, and I picked this one on perseverance and resilience because, you know, at times I think we can all kind of, we, we can all identify, relate to that person that's sitting up on the screen. And some of us read different things into it, and you look at the person who's sitting there, and it could be the, they're just deep in prayer. Or it could be, wow. I don't know how much more I can take. You know, they just need one more thing to go wrong and snap, it's gone. It could be, I'm, I've been trying my best and I've been doing everything that I can do and now I just can't do anymore. So is this you today? Is this you sitting in that pew today? Hitting the end of your energy? The end of your patience, the end of fill in the blank, whatever it is that seems to be troubling you at this point in time. Because lately it seems like 
the train to hope it took the last train to Boston you know that train to hope that we that we kind of count on it it left town it left town and I know all last week this this song kept ringing through my head who'll stop the rain and I'm not just talking about the water falling from the skies but it's all the other things in life that seem to be raining down on us all the all the strife all the things that are hitting us the covid the ratio all those things raining down upon us each and every day it's not hard to become that person sitting in the pew it becomes overwhelming see it's a good thing to be whelmed but it's not a really good thing to be overwhelmed when we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel so some of you are probably out there saying, well, way to go, Pastor Mark. I thought I came to be here to be uplifted today, and instead, you're bumming me out. And see, that would be right. You did come here to get uplifted today. But we, at the same time, we have to face those realities that we have to live within each and every day. And these times lately, they've been very challenging times with COVID and the civil unrest, riots, fires, the derecho, the current political turmoil that's going on, all that infighting, and obviously that constant barrage of negative campaign ads that are out there from both sides. Choose a side. So it's been a tough year by any stretch of the imagination. But see, we have to have hope. We have to have faith. Because in the midst of all this, the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. In the midst of all the troubles, in the midst of everything else, the body of Christ has remained resilient. And this is the thing that kept coming back to me and coming back to me over the last couple of months and so when I started writing down some ideas for sermons here a few weeks ago and I started in on um, this sermon here and writing the sermon all these things just kept coming into my mind is you know in spite of it all here we are in spite of it all so I kind of made some notes in here and I want to make sure I don't miss any of them but we've gathered in different ways and in different places, yet we stood steadfast as the church. Everything's different, but we haven't changed. And I really want you to think about that as I'm giving the message today. Everything is different, but we haven't changed. And when I'm talking we, I'm talking about the body of Christ, the church, God's people. We have found peace in God's promise never to leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. We are still called together. We are still one in Christ. We are still one in the body. In our struggles, we have lived out our faith in the midst of the unknown. We have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. We can rest assured that God is still on the throne. He is still in charge of the master plan. And ultimately, he controls our fate. And that should give us hope. Hope in the midst. So we may have feel as though that hope hopped the train, last train for Boston. But really, it hasn't. Hope is for it's resilient. It resides within us, and we need to share it with one another. Today, no matter where we are, where we gather together, we remain God's people. No matter what building we meet in, we are still God's church. See, our mission hasn't changed. Our calling hasn't been altered, and nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. That's a promise from God that once we 
unite ourselves together. We are God's people. We are God's people. We are the church. The church isn't the building. The church is us within the building. We are his people. And today, we stand resilient. When we face the trials in our life, we can either adopt an attitude of being a victim or a victor. And your choice, your choice will dictate what the outcome is. So we can either choose to be a victim and take that woe is me upon us and, you know, trot ourselves down in life. Or we can say, no, I'm going to rise above this. I'm going to be a victor because I can do anything through God who strengthens me. I can lean upon those understandings of who God is and what he does in our lives today. And we can rise above any situation because my God is bigger than any situation that I will ever face. That's a promise that we can stand upon. That's a promise, a foundation that we can build our lives upon. So I wrote a sermon a couple of years ago in that I talked about how our attitude affects every aspect of our lives. And there's an old saying that goes that your attitude determines your altitude. And nothing could be truer. Your attitude determines your altitude. In other words, a positive, faith-filled attitude will cause you to rise higher in life, but a negative, self-critical attitude will only drag you down. And see, nobody else can determine what your attitude is going to be but you. But you. It's your choice. It's your choice to get up in the morning and say, wow, good morning. And I prefer that you get up and say, good morning, God. Because that's a great way to start your day. But there's too many of them that just go, oh, I have to face another day. And they start off on a negative note. And that negative note then kind of carries that attitude through the day. And then they can't figure out why at the end of the day they had such a bad day. But see, that attitude that they started their day out with, if it was a positive attitude, nine times out of ten, you're going to have a positive day. You're going to look at the situations you face in life each and every day in a different perspective. In a different perspective. So no one else can determine your attitude but you. There's an old saying also that goes, misery loves company. And it's important to note that there's a difference between reaching out for help to someone else and dragging them down into your misery. Dragging them down with you. When we try to get others to come, come aboard that misery ship that we're floating around in at the time, See, it doesn't do anything to lift them up. It only drags them down. And it's not fair to drown others in our pity pool that we're having, in that pity party. And it's too easy sometimes to say, oh, come on in. The water's fine. Join me. And a lot of times it's, it's all based in gossip and things like that and, you know, People get together and they start talking negatively about all kinds of different things. It could be the company. They, somebody's upset about something that happened to them. Come on. Water's fine. Join me. And pretty soon, then you start looking at things in a different vein. And you start looking upon the negative, And then everything that follows is going to be negative. See, the things that we focus on are the things that determine... Our choices that we make. So if we focus on the negative, we're going to make negative choices. If we focus on the positive, we're going to change that perspective. And we're going to affect change by our attitude. 
So I ask you to look at what the other people will face if they join you. Are they going to face negative? Don't invite them to the party. Instead, unless they're help in pulling you from the pool. Reach out to others. If you're having a problem with something, reach out to others. Have them help you. Allow them to help you. That word allow makes all the difference in the world. Don't become discouraged at the appearance of what you're facing. You need to accept the truth that God is bigger than the problem you face, no matter what. No matter what. His truth is in the scriptures, and it tells us that if we call out to God in our time of need, he will answer those prayers if it comes from an earnest heart. Now, a lot of people use that verse and they go, well, here's my Christmas list for today, God. I want these things. But that's not what it's about. That's not what that verse is about. That's not what God is saying there. When we face adversity, our attitude always affects the outcome. So we need to change our perspective. Choose to persevere through the issue. You must believe that the situation you're going through is for a purpose. And we heard that back in the scripture, the call to worship today. And see, if there's a purpose behind it, and if God has a purpose for the adversity that you're facing, he will also enable you and empower you to get through it. He will enable you and empower you to get through it. God will give you the power to overcome it. It's important to remember that everything that's happened in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, are all shaping you into the person that God wants you to be. That's the person you were born to be. And you need to have the correct attitude. A bad attitude is going to lead to discouragement. And that discouragement can rob you of your joy, your peace, and your contentment. You see, there's no hope in discouragement. But I got great news for you if you're disheartened. I told you I was going to lift you up somehow today. You're not stuck there. Have hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. A light in the darkness. The scripture says in Matthew 9, 29, According to your faith it will be done unto you. And see, that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. According to your faith it will be done to you. What are you expecting God to do in your life? Are you living a life of expectancy? Are you expecting bad? Or are you expecting good? A lot of redundant or questions that I'm asking here for self-examination today. Because the whole time I was writing this, I was asking myself the same things. See, when we give these messages today it's as much for us as it is for anybody listening in so god has established a law and it's called that law of expectation the fact is when we tend to get out of life what we expect out of it we tend to get out of life what we expect to get out of it we tend to see what we expect to see and we tend to hear what we expect to hear we tend to feel the way we expect to feel we inevitably accomplish what we expect we're going to accomplish. Huh, how about that? So what is all that predicated on? That expectation. What drives it? What drives your choices? Your attitude, right? Your attitude. So that is the law of faith. God says, you get to choose because according to your faith, it will be done unto you. You get to choose. It's all a matter of your life choices. 
Another important verse on faith in the Bible is in Hebrews 11, 6, and it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So how many of you out there are parents? I know some of you aren't yet. Okay. How many of you are pleased when your children trust you? I am. See, God is the same way. God is our Heavenly Father, and God is pleased when we trust Him. That's why the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. See, we have to have that trust in God as the basis for our faith. And if we don't trust in God, then it's impossible for us to please God. It's as hard as that, and it's as simple as that at the same time. You can obey God, you can do the right thing, and still not be pleasing to God because you're not doing it out of faith. So it's important to learn how to live expectantly as you learn to live by faith. Remember when we started this whole thing off? We were talking about discipline. How discipline is training your mind mind and your body to work together. That's what this verse is saying. You can obey God and you can do the right thing and still not ple pleasing to God because you're not doing it in faith. So it's important to learn how to live expectantly as you learn to live by faith. It takes discipline. Whatever is not of faith, the Bible says in Romans 14, is sin about that one and because that's true we need to talk today about how we grow in our faith and Luke 17 5 Luke says to Jesus he says Lord increase our faith how do you do that I'd like to have more faith I know you'd like to have more faith and if that's what pleases God then I want more of it the question is how if faith makes my life rewarding and fulfilling and confident, how does God build up my faith? So is there a magic pill that exists somewhere that I can take and boom, I got faith? Well, no. No. Remember that word discipline? We have to train ourselves to live a godly life. Live a holy life is what the scripture told us this morning. So can we take vitamins for it? No. Is there some kind of therapy that we can go through that will make us more rewarding in our life? No. Is there a seminar that you can go to to build your faith? Well, no, not really. But there are some that can help. Here's the secret. And it's not really something you're real excited about when you first hear it. But the truth is, God builds your faith by testing it. Uh -oh. God builds your faith by testing it. And this is the second portion of that discipline in there. Faith is like a muscle, and when it's stretched, it's pulled, and then it develops. When you test your muscles against weight, your muscles develop, and when you test your faith, it gets developed as it's tested. So the trials that we go through life are necessary to build our faith. And you don't develop your faith by just sitting on your blessed assurance in the church. Uh, testing your faith develops perseverance so that you may be mature and complete, James 1, 3. He says the purpose of these tests is that it tests our faith. Our perseverance will grow and will be made mature and complete. And if we go to the book of Job in there and we look at the book of Job, Job says the same thing. And he was speaking from experience in Job 7, 17 and 18. What is man that you make so much of him and that you give him so much attention and that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? I'd like to have you think about that phrase for a moment. Test him. As it says there in the scripture. 
Did you realize that God is testing you every moment of your life? So in The Purpose Driven Life, which is a book by Rick Warren, it talks about how life is a test and it's a temporary assignment and it's a trust relationship. And these are the facts of life. Every moment of your day, your faith is being tested. In fact, all this past week it was tested. All next week, your faith is going to be tested. Every day you have faith building opportunities. The problem is most of us don't recognize them until they're there. Until they're there. We tend to flunk the test because we don't even realize it's a test that God is using to help us grow. God is not there waiting for us to slip up. He's there waiting to catch us. When we do. I don't know how much more of a concept that can be more important in our lives than understanding that God isn't there waiting to slam the hammer down on us when we make a mistake. But he is there to catch us when we're falling and build us back up. So, I want to give you four ways that God tests our faith so that you'll be aware of them, so you'll know when they're coming at you. Actually, there's more than just four, but these are the ones that I want to cover today, and they're kind of the most common. So these are the four most common ways that God tests and builds our faith, and you'll probably get tested on every one of them this week. Count on it. In fact, You'll probably have some of them all in one day. So number one, God tests our faith through difficulties. And what he's doing is he's saying, how do we respond to that test? How do we respond to the difficulty that God places before us? Now, if you're like me, I'm a fixer. I'm a troubleshooter. It's what I do for a living. So, somebody brings me a problem, I immediately want to try and fix it. But see, that means I have to lean on my own understanding. So when God gives us a test, and he's going to see how we work to things, do we turn to God first for the answer? Turn to God first for guidance? Or do we lean on our own understanding? Well, that ugly term that I hate, human nature, tends to go to the latter. We tend to stand on our own understanding instead of going to God first. So number two, God tests our faith by how we act and react towards others. I failed that test several times in traffic this last week. I got to tell you, it's a tough one. <laughs> With all the junk going in the streets and all the limbs and trees hanging out there and cones where there's not normally cones and uh, people driving like crazy out there, um, it's hard not to be tested. But, you know, our faith gets tested by how we act and react to others. And if somebody comes in and they have a really, really, really bad attitude on Monday morning because they really don't want to be there and they want to share that attitude with everybody else, how do you act or react to that person? See, that's a test from God. Do you react out of love and say, hey, is there a problem? Is there something I can help you with? Ooh, different reaction. That's your attitude and you choose to make that choice. That choice is how you pass or fail the test. So God tests our faith by our choices. What we put our focus on or in. Whether it's work, money, material things. Do we value those more than the gifts that God gives us every day? The blessings that he chooses to give us? Do we tend to recognize more the money, the material things, work, rather than what God is blessing us with each and every day? 
We have to change our perspective so we see the blessings that God gives us. Recognize them for what they are and understand that those blessings that he's given us will probably help us through that test that we're going through at that point in time. Remember, God's going to give us and empower us the things we need to get through the tests that he gives us. We used to call that open book test in school, my favorite kind of test. Because they give us the answers right along with the test. It's an easy test. Guess what? God gives us the answers too. He wrote them down and put them in a book. Open book test each and every day. How much better can I get than that? Number four, God tests our faith by how we serve others. Are we serving our own interests first? And then giving the leftovers to others. I got to turn that around a little bit too. Because when I was laying there awake again this morning. Uh, God says, hey, are you giving me your best first? Or am I just getting your leftovers? So God tests our faith by how we serve others. God happens to be one of them. Are we doing all we can to serve God? Are we saying thank you to God by our actions for the things that he gives us, for the blessings he gives us each and every day? Or is he just kind of getting leftovers? Huh, makes you think, doesn't it? I think we're all guilty at some point in time. So when we face life as it happens, we can face it with fear, or faith. We can be afraid of that test and we can be afraid of the outcome. Or we can face it with faith. Knowing God is with us each and every step of the way. God will empower us. God will embolden us to get through that test. Where faith is home, fear cannot abide. Where faith is at home. So if faith rests in your heart, fear can't rest there at the same time. Fear drives us away from God and faith brings us closer to God. This holds true for our calling that God has on our lives. Faith will allow us to grow and fear will keep us from having the fulfilled life that God has planned. Let me read that again. Fear drives us away from God and faith brings us closer to God. This holds true for our calling that God has on our lives. Faith will allow us to grow. Fear will keep us from having fulfilled lives. Our hearts turn away from the living God when we refuse to have faith and believe in him. If we persist in our unbelief, God will eventually leave us alone to wallow in our sin. But God can give us new hearts, new desire, new spirits. We find that in Ezekiel 36. And to prevent us having an unbelieving heart, stay in fellowship with other believers. Talk daily about your mutual faith. Be aware of the deceitfulness of sin. Because it not only attracts, but it destroys. It destroys lives. It destroys relationship. It holds us in bondage to fear. Encourage each other with love and concern. God is not only a disciplining parent but also a demanding coach who pushes us to our limits, requires us to live our lives being disciplined in a holy discipline. Although we may not feel strong enough to push on to victory, we will be able to accomplish it as we follow Christ and draw on his strength. Then we can use our growing strength to those around us to help them who are weak, who are struggling, who may not even know that there is an alternative to all that bad that they're going through in their lives. 
Be that beacon of light to others. Allow God to work within your hearts to reach out to those other people, the lost, the least, those who have less than you. Then we can use that growing strength to help those people who are struggling. See, we can't live our lives with our own survival in mind. We can't live our lives with our own survival in mind. Others then will follow our example. And then we just, instead of being a community, we shrink down to a oneness of self, self-centeredness, and live a life of sin. We were born to be in community with others. We were given the blessings that we were given to share with one another in community. Does your example make it easier for others to believe in and to follow Christ and to mature in him? Or those who follow you tend to end up confused and misled by your actions? So I wrote that one on Friday after witnessing some things that happened in our office. And we had a person come in with a really, 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 really horrible attitude on Friday. And Friday usually is a pretty mellow day. But I went over and talked to that person. And I said, hey, you know, what's going on? Is there something I can help you with? And we talked for probably 45 minutes about his divorce that he was going through, that he went through, about how he doesn't get to see his daughters, his wife took him and moved away out of, out of town so he doesn't get to see him as he's supposed to be by court order. And he was really down and he was hurting. He was struggling. Now others were kind of responding with his attitude of, you know, saying a few choice words and walking away. But I had a different type of choice of words. We sat and talked. We got him through some of his struggles. And you know what? His attitude changed. He walked away with a smile on his face. How do we serve God and serve others? Is our faith being a beacon? That light in the darkness? The inner darkness that that person is facing? If not, we need to turn our lights on. Crank up our generator and shine brightly for others. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14 says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you today and we just pray that you would take your message that you gave us today. Take it into our hearts. Help us to make the best choices that we can make. Help us to serve you by serving others. Help us to build our faith by accepting those challenges happily with a great attitude to come to you and to allow your work and your will to be done in our lives each and every day. Thank you for the blessings that you give us of this church family and this church community that we can lean on each other and lift each other up. And then go out and do the same for those in our community, those who we work with, those who we just maybe meet at the store. Thank you, Father God, for giving us a loving, caring heart. In Jesus' name. Well, today, our live stream 
kind of goes back to perseverance and resilience. Because as soon as Facebook picked up the, the uh, music for the video, it shut the live stream down. So we got it started back up and thanks everybody for joining us again online. Um, just a little bit different take on the sermon title today. But we will put a link on our Facebook page to the YouTube channel uh, with the full video on it. Probably cut that out so we don't have any problems there. And you can watch the whole thing and we'll put a, a link to the actual video for that Eagle song because it is an amazing song. So thank you for bearing with us and, and staying with us. But as I listened to Mark this morning, Especially, the, 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 and you know, it's always the last thing you hear is the, is the one thing that, that sticks with you almost the most. And as I'm thinking about uh, Mark talking to this person, taking the, the opportunity to share Christ's love, to love his neighbor, uh, um, I, I'm drawn to the Psalms, and specifically Psalm 34, where it's in verse 17, 18, it says, The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. This guy was calling out for help just in a way that most people didn't care to hear. But if we take an opportunity to listen, then this is what happens. He rescues them from all their troubles. In this instance, he sent Mark to rescue this gentleman. And then in verse 18, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescued those whose spirits are crushed. When we persevere and when we have resilience, God is there with us. And it is through perseverance and resilience, I'm just going to stumble over those today, that we can come to the table that Christ set for us. For it was on the night that he was betrayed that he took the bread. And just imagine what was going through his mind at that time. The love that he had for his disciples. Because, you know, if, if we step back just a little bit before the meal, he actually washed all the disciples' feet. He served them. Knowing what was coming, he persevered and he served them, teaching them in the moment. But during the meal, he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then a little later in the meal, he filled the cup once again and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Scripture reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do so until Christ returns. It also tells us that Christ will not partake in this meal again until he comes into his kingdom. We thank him for his perseverance and his resilience. As we have done in the past, we, we, we love to do uh, communion by intention where a piece of bread is taken and dipped in the cup. But we're persevering and we're resilient in this time of this COVID virus. So we have these cups. If you're online and you would like to join us in communion each week, let us know. Drop us a note in the comments. Uh, call us. Drop us an email. Whatever. We'll get some of these to you so that you can come with and come to the table with us the body of Christ. The blood of Christ. Father God, we thank you for what this meal represents. We thank you that through your word we are able to be resilient and to persevere through all things that come, whether it is a storm a, a natural storm or whether it's a storm within our lives you were always there to build us up thank you for sending people in our lives to do just that Father. let us as a church persevere and be resilient for others helping them on their walk so that they can know you in a much deeper and more intimate way in Jesus' name, amen. Invite Denise up here. We'll have our agape time. And Good morning. 
So is there anything anybody would like to share this morning at all before I start in? <laughs> for Anne is really okay. Okay. Ellen Diane. Yes. Yes, Lord. We pray for Terry. So he will be healed. <laughs> He's all excited. <laughs> oh, and then I guess I would like prayers for my um, son and daughter in law. They lost their grandfather, uh, Elaine's grandfather, Friday. And they live in uh, Wyoming and Idaho. So I'll pray for them. And Harold sent me a text this morning, and he lost his uh, best friend today, and his name's Bill Hodel, and that was one of my dad's good friends, too, and so there's a lot of loss this week, and um, a lot of prayers for people, so, and I just want to say that uh, this video that you shared this morning about the whole in the world tonight, I just, God just really spoke to me about um, that we have a hole in our heart. And the only way that hole will get filled is if we read his word. So let's just go to prayer. And I just pray that uh, God will fill that hole with his word. And um, Father God, we just come to you in prayer this morning. You are so good and you are so faithful to us. There are so many people hurting, as you've heard this morning. They lift up Anne and Harold, and my Uncle Harold, and, and um, they lift up Terry for surgery. They lift up Elaine and Barack and their family for the loss this week. And there's a lot of unspoken um, people that need prayer. And as we get older, Lord, older people have read your book. A lot of them have come to the Lord before they have passed. And I'm grateful for that, Lord Jesus. And um, I'm just concerned about the, the young people of this world, Lord Jesus. They need you. They need guidance, Lord God. And I just pray that they will open your word and read it and let it resonate with their heart. Listen to what you're telling them and trust in them and let them trust in you, Lord Jesus, as they continue in this world, Lord God, and help them to fill that hole in their heart before their time comes. Father God, we just, we just thank you for so many things that you do for us on a daily basis that we don't even know about. And we just love you, and we um, honor you today, Lord God. And we thank you for your life and um, your faithfulness each and every day to us. Amen. This does conclude our online version. Thank you for those that have joined us this morning. We saw many new faces on uh, pop up, so thank you for joining us this morning. We pray that the message will resonate with you, that it will grab hold of your heart and help you through the coming days, weeks, months, and years of your life. Father, thank you for the message that you gave Pastor Mark this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you. In Jesus' name.